to continue along this this line, we have an, uh, another discusser. Uh, Karen Shea is the Vice President of Maternal and Child Services for Anthem Inc., the country's second largest provider of health insurance coverage, serving 37 million members. Um, her career has been devoted to meeting health care needs of women and children, and prior to joining Anthem, Karen held clinical and administrative leadership positions in leading academic centers, including Mass General, uh, Dartmouth uh, Children's Hospital in D.C., and most recently, uh, St. Joseph's Hospital in Tampa. She has a B.S. in nursing um, and, uh, from uh, Rhode Island, a master's in nursing from California, Long Beach, and is a certified nurse pr practitioner. So I guess this is this is a little bit better than I thought. I thought there were three speakers in this time frame. So are there only two? So I can I can spend a little bit of time. Okay, great. We have some flexibility. Okay, great. So thank you very much. I really. Yeah. Uh, the. Okay, fine. All right, good. Well, I'll tr I I won't. <laughs> All right, cool. I, uh, all right, well, thank you, Anna. I will, I'll, um, you know, keep it small. Okay, keep it short. I'm very, very pleased to be here with you this afternoon. And this is my first time. It's great to be with this group. Um, I've heard so many of the other speakers who've reached this podium sort of give their testament to um, their experience with breastfeeding. So I'm going to follow suit. I'm very fortunate to have three children who were all born in the 80s, and I worked up to the day before I delivered them and um, managed uh, to breastfeed all three nine months and longer in the 80s, which, you know, was pretty rare. And But I was very fortunate. I was so much more fortunate than many other women because I worked in the hospital environment. And right outside my private office door, I had a hospital-grade breast pump, which you, you can't beat that. So um, I was very fortunate. And um, so anyway, I'm not only the president for the hair club for men, but I'm also a, I'm also a member, right? <laughs> so um, let me just tell you a little bit about um, about Anthem and um, and about insurance. I you know I'm really here to listen, Ruth. I know you want me to discuss, but there's so much I feel as though I can learn from all of you. But um, I also feel if we're going to partner, maybe you need to learn a little bit more about me and what we do. And yes, we play, pay claims. And yes, there's a lot of tension. And yes, we feel some individuals feel as though, you know, we do more denying than we do paying. But um, I, I also want to make sure that you know that we really are committed to wellness and we're committed to um, making sure people are healthy. And and really, as an insurance carrier, and I guess there are at least three or four of us here in the room, we really do bear the risk for making sure people stay healthy. And so to that extent, what I'd like to make sure that all of you know is that we not only pay claims, but that we also have divisions and legions of people within our companies who are devoted to case management, to identifying risk, to deploying um, services, to make sure that, that individuals know what their benefits are. So let's go to the next slide, or, although I have this right here, so let's let me do it myself. So anyway, let me just tell you a little bit about about Anthem, yeah, we play a lot of claims and we spend a lot of money and we make a lot of phone calls and we partner with an awful lot of physicians. And for the most part, I guess we have about 37 million members and most of the membership is in the commercial population. But um, we have quite a bit of membership in what we call the government business division, which is Medicare and Medicaid. And um, and in our commercial uh, side of the business, which would be, and the other speaker, um, Dr. Trunk was saying that you know, her company is mostly a commercial provider, so you work with employers who purchase health care services. So to that side of the Anthem business, we have about 28% of the market share, and we're in, in about 14 different states. But what I really wanted to do is to talk with you today about Medicaid, because m half of the, well, 45% of deliveries in the country right now are covered by a Medicaid benefit. And what, um, what states do, and, and Medicaid is a state-based um, service. So if you know one state, 
and the way in which they officiate their Medicaid benefit, well, let me tell you, you know one state. Every state seems to be completely different, and it's incumbent upon us to learn how that Medicaid benefit is, is um, officiated in that particular state. And what states do, some states um, manage their own health benefit, and other states hire companies, managed care organizations, in order to you know, manage that benefit for, for them. And um, what we do is we come into the state and we say we're going to do we're going to manage the costs better than you can on your own and we can um in addition improve the clinical outcome and so many states will then say we're going to give you this medicaid business but we also are going to hold you accountable to certain measures so we've talked about pco1 and pco2 meaning the early elective delivery rate and <clears throat> and uh, low risk c section rate etc there are a number of different measures preterm delivery rate low birth weight rate so the states will say to us we'll give you that business but we want to make sure that the quality or what we call um, sort of our, our value prop proposition is being is being managed as well. Um, we want to make sure that we provide the service with great satisfaction and that we provide thought leadership for each of the states so that they can better manage that benefit. <clears throat> so on the um, government business division side, specifically within Medicaid, we cover about 5.2 million lives and we're in um, 19 different states. The largest of those states being California and Texas and Florida. And I know that um, there are quite a few people in the room from Virginia. Our Medicaid sort of home base is in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Our corporate he headquarters is in um, Indianapolis, Indiana. But the whole characteristic of the Medicaid population, we all know this, that they're much sicker than the general population. They have uh, um, more chronic conditions, um, uh, physical and mental and chronic conditions, um, unable to work, et cetera. So that's really just characteristic of the population that we're serving. But in terms of the pregnant population, and this was also mentioned by the prior speaker, we see that 44.9% of the nation's deliveries right now are covered by Medicaid. And it's much higher in some states, particularly you can see in this slide, those states that are in the sort of the future color um, down, down in the south, that you know greater than 50% of the deliveries in those states are covered by Medicaid. So for example, in Louisiana, it's closer to 70%. So we know if we can make a difference for Medicaid beneficiaries, then we're really going to drive outcomes um, nationally. And my point being that Medicaid is a state-based program, and so we can work with those 50 states to make sure that the way in which those benefits are um, officiated is that we're using best practices. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about what we do um, within the government business division of Anthem in order to make sure that you know, women have access to services from, from a continuum from early on, and you know, we all say that preconception health begins at birth, right? You're preparing yourself, you're preparing your vessel to, you know, to procreate, to have that next generation. But what we do is we go out and, and uh, work with uh, our states and, and women on preconception and interconception health. We want to make sure that women know what their benefits are and that they think about are they ready for pregnancy. And, and often we'll say to ourselves, well, um, you know, I've I've got the degree that I wanted, I've gone to school, and or I've got the job that I've wanted, or I have a house or a safe place to live, and I have someone that I really am committed to and I'm willing to have a child with, but do we often think about I'm physically ready to have, have this child, that I'm bringing my best self to this experience, and that I've got my chronic conditions under in, in order, my weight, is my blood pressure, et cetera, before I have that pregnancy. So we do a lot of work on preconception health where I feel as though we have more levers to pull um, clearly is in those social determinants of health and you know that whole aspect of reproductive life course planning where insurance companies really don't have that leverage is in looking at um, fair housing a livable wage education etc um, but then what we do is we work really hard to identify pregnant women and it was mentioned earlier that we you know look at claims we look at authorizations but in the Medicaid space if you're eligible for Medicaid 
it's often because you're pregnant, because the federal poverty level for pregnancy and eligibility for Medicaid is so much lower. So in many of our states, it's 200% of the FPL or, or even higher. And so you become eligible for, for pregnancy and you join a plan, which we call as a PW plan. So we can harvest that information that comes across on an enrollment file and identify a woman who's pregnant. In a commercial population, you have to wait until you get a claim. Well, okay, she's already gone to see a doctor by then, which is a good thing, but you really can't influence early prenatal care if you're waiting for that first claim to come in to identify a woman as pregnant. Um, we have a whole team of individuals who work on screening women for, for risk. We use predictive modeling. Um, we call it the Stork score so that once you answer our 10 or 20 different questions, we can give you a predictive score as to whether uh, you're, the likelihood of you having a baby admitted to the NICU. Once you're um, stratified by risk, then you're eligible for certain services like case management, where we can call you up and develop an individualized care plan to, um, to help you to manage through your pregnancy to have the best possible outcome. We have individuals who do NICU management and, and advocacy. And it was also mentioned earlier that I'm, I'm actually a neonatal nurse practitioner, so very well of the advantages of breast milk in terms of reducing the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. And then we advocate. We do things like this. We advocate internally for the needs of pregnant women and children up to the one year of age. And then also, I do a lot of external events as well. Um, and what we actually do in our pregnancy management, this is the core of the, of the work that we do. We provide information. We actually provide incentives to women for prenatal and postpartum visits, uh, care management. We make sure that we're harnessing what the community has to offer. So we refer to the Nurse Family Partnership. I'm, I'm sure that a lot of folks in this room are aware of that organization um, and the good work that they've done and the excellent outcomes that they've seen because they stick to the fidelity of a good model. Um, care coordination and you utilization management. And these are some of the tools that we're using. Uh, we have health promotion materials and then um, an interactive voice response call program that's used as well as a texting program and a smartphone application that mom can download that gives her information throughout her pregnancy to prepare her for delivery. And then it uh, calls a received or she has access to that app up to three months after she delivers. So it's during the context of that information, either case management or the outreaches that we make, that we talk about preparing for delivery and um, ask mom to consider whether she's going to breastfeed or not and to talk with her physician about that. Um, we refer to a number of different agencies and um, make sure that if a mom can't make it to her visit, then she has access to a transportation benefit. We make sure she has um, knowledge of that as well. And then I know a lot of folks are going to say, look, do you provide pumps? And of course, we provide pumps. It's part of the, um, the Women's Preventive um, Health Benefit Package. But we did this even before the Affordable Care Act, that if mom wants a pump, then she shows up with a prescription. She goes to a DME provider. She gets a pump. If she needs a hospital-grade pump, we do have authorization criteria that we use. And if she's eligible for that hospital grade pump, then she can either rent it or buy it. Um, and so these are some of the policy considerations that I wanted to sort of offer to the group um, as I was thinking about what we might do uh, to partner together. And, you know, because we're a, a managed care organization and we pay for services, what I did is I concentrated my thoughts around the areas of um, how can we reimburse for lactation support services. And so my first point here is a consistent adoption of best practices for support and coverage of um, breastfeeding across all of the different Medicaid states. If we have one Medicaid state who's doing it right and you're seeing good outcomes, what we should do is sort of think about what are the elements of their program that other states might adopt. I've seen this happen again and again and again as um, states have looked to, like let's say South Carolina has really done a great job in their um, um, they have a collaborative improving birth outcomes uh, group that's been meeting for a number of years, and many states have looked to that group for best practices and adopt them ac across their um, Medicaid book of business. So, um, you know, in terms of early elective delivery, et cetera, and I hope I'm not stealing your talk, Anna. <laughs> so, so um, 
you know, really uh, disseminating best practices, but then also in the area of lactation uh, consultation credentialing, I know that if I'm going to pay a provider for a service, they need to be in my network. They need to be in my system. And in order to get into my system, they have to be credentialed. And I have to have certain standards by which to accept that individual um, as a credentialed provider. What licensing standard would we use? What education standard would we use? So, um, so that we you know, ha have the means to appropriately credential them as an individual provider. But then also, um, on top of the issues of credentialing and licensing, there's the issue of medical necessity criteria. When I'm authorizing a home visit, what I do is I look at the medical, the, the clinical that comes to me. What is mom's condition? Has she just delivered a baby? That in and of itself is enough. But then is she now having difficulty breastfeeding? Is she, um, does she have an infection? Does she have some impediment to success that makes her eligible for advanced consultation or advanced services. So what we say is, what are the medical necessity criteria that would allow me to say, well, she should have one home visit, or she should have two consultative services, or she should have more. So looking at medical necessity criteria around, around breastfeeding. And then in addition, what should we pay for these services? So um, if it's one visit or two visits or three visits by a, a mid-level consultation person or a high-level consultation person, what really are the reimbursement rates that should be paid for these services? So um, those are some of the policy considerations that I've wa I wanted to offer. But then in closing, um, just um, in terms of summary and conclusions, um, nearly half of the nation's births are covered by Medicaid more so in some states than others. The state Medicaid agencies play a unique role in establishing benefits and payment for healthcare services. So for example, when we come into a state, they tell us what we're gonna cover, how we're gonna cover, and what we're gonna pay for this. This is all regulated by the state Medicaid agency. Population health is a, fund a role of, fundamental role of managed care organizations, and breastfeeding support is being provided by managed care organizations, but um, establishing credentialing and payment policy standards may increase access to breastfeeding. So thank you. And I think what we'll do, thanks to my slip up, Ruth. Uh, that we will have, have Anna come up and then we'll take questions together. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you very much.